Shorahbil ordered him to be tied up securely, then advanced and beheaded him as a captive. And so when the news reached Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was angered. He was upset. You cannot kill a Muslim messenger and expect no retribution. No <laughs> أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على خير الخلق أجمعين أبي القاسم محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد Respected Muslim brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. As usual, whenever we do a, a bio, a biography, we give a brief introduction to explain why and you know why this person's biography is important. So today we will be going over the man, the legend himself, you know, Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, also known as Ja'far al-Tayyar. Ja'far al-Tayyar, why do we need to go over the biography of this man? Why is this man important? Ja'far al-Tayyar, I remember when I did my top 10 like Sahaba series, I remember saying in the introduction something along the lines of, we're not going to go over Abu Talib and Ja'far and Hamza because the Ahlul Bayt, the Prophet's relatives, are on a different level. The, those people are in a category of their own. We do not group them together with the Sahaba. To do so would almost be, uh, it would take up too much space on the list. So inshallah, what we will be doing now is we're going to be go over, going over their bios, you know, separately. So inshallah, we'll go over the biography of Hamza ibn Abd al-Muttalib, his uncle as well. Who is Ja'far al-Tayyar? Why is his biography important? Ja'far al-Tayyar, you look at his, a summary of his character, of his personality. He was a nobleman, a generous paragon of chivalry, you know, famously the winged martyr, the hero of the Battle of Mu'tah, the prophet's diplomat and his beloved cousin, and the founder of the first Muslim community in Africa. And so these are just a few of his, his basic accomplishments. And Jafar al-Tayyar in many ways is very mavloom. And we're going to go over this in a number of stages in the lecture. But Jafar al-Tayyar, many people don't mention him that much. Many people do not, when they know, they hear about Ja'far al-Tayyar, they know it's like, you know, oh, he's the one, he has wings, he's, his name Ja'far al-Tayyar. But beyond that, like his early life, his, his merits, his great manatib, his struggles, his character, his personality, all of these things, like no one really talks about them. And even today, Ja'far al-Tayyar's shrine in Jordan is very neglected, it's very mahjur. It's very difficult to see people who go and visit his shrine, it's difficult to see people who talk about him. And we covered the life of his nephew, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. And I would argue that he was greater than his nephew. In many ways, he's very similar to Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, but he was greater in a number of ways. But Ja'far al-Tayyar is so many things all in one. He teaches you about nobility, generosity. He teaches you about you know, how to be a good husband. He teaches you how to give da'wah, how to be a good missionary, we would say. He is one of the early missionaries in Islam. And at the end of the day, his story ends with jihad fi sabilillah. His story ends with that taboo topic, that dirty word, with jihad fi sabilillah. Ja'far al-Tayyar, like we said, he's a very neglected figure. And as many of you know, me as a person who dives into history and reads these biographies, I hate to see a great man getting neglected. We've mentioned this in the biographies of other great companions of the Prophet. And Ja'far al-Tayyar is very similar. He's a very, very great man with a very, you know, amazing legacy. And so, inshallah, today we're going to go over his life in order that we learn how to better ourselves as Muslims through his example. Because Ja'far is not great because he is the brother of Ali. Notice I did not say that he is the brother of Amir al-Mu'mineen. That is not one of his merits. It is certainly something he pro was proud of. It is certainly something that Amir al-Mu'mineen himself was proud of, that Ja'far al-Tayyar was his brother. But that's not what made him great. Ja'far al-Tayyar is great because Ja'far al-Tayyar is Ja'far al-Tayyar. Today, inshallah, as I go over his biography, ask yourself what lessons I can learn from this man's biography, how I can emulate this man, who is no doubt one of our great Salaf al-Salih and one of the greatest figures of that first generation of Muslims. So with that being said, we're going to go ahead and get started. We're going to dive right in. Ja'far ibn Abi Talib was born in Mecca 20 years after the year of the elephant, which corresponds to the year 33 before the Hijrah. This means that he was 20 years younger than Rasulullah and he was martyred at the Battle of Mu'tah in the year 8 after Hijrah, making him the first Talibi 
the first one of Al, uh, uh, Al Abi Talib to be martyred. Jafar ibn Abi Talib's lineage is as follows. He is Jafar ibn Abi Talib, whose name was Abd Manaf, ibn Abd al Muttalib, whose name was Shayba, ibn Hashim, whose name was Amr, ibn Abd Manaf, whose name was Murira, bin Qusay, whose name was Zayd, bin Kilab, bin Murra, bin Ka'ab, bin Lu'ay, bin Ghalib, bin Fihr, bin Malik. And his mother was a Sayyidah Fatima bint Asad bin Hashim bin Abd Manaf. And so some of his famous titles, his kunya is Aba Abdullah. And this kunya, he, uh, his eldest son was Abdullah ibn Ja'far, who many of you may have heard of. He was the husband of Sayyidah Zainab. And he was also a, a Sahabi who was very famous in his own right for his generosity. It is narrated from Abu Huraira that the kunya of, Abu, uh, of Ja'far Tayyar, another kunya that he had was Abu al-Masakin. His titles are a shaheed and a tayyar. When it comes to his basic information, there are a few facts that stand out about his early life. One of them is this amazing hadith, which is recorded in the Amali of Shaykh al Saduq. So, Shaykh al Saduq narrates this hadith in his Amali, uh, and this is narrated by, uh, by Imam al Baqir. Imam al Baqir narrates, he says, Allah revealed to his messenger, O Allah ila Rasulihi. He says, I have thanked Ja'far ibn Abi Talib for four characteristics. There are four characteristics that Ja'far ibn Abi Talib has that I am very proud of. I will reward him for these. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa called him and informed him. He said, Ja'far, Allah has revealed to me that he is, is pleased with you, that he is happy with you because of four characteristics that you have. So Ja'far sallallahu said, had Allah not informed you, I would not inform you. Which means, Ya Rasulullah, I would not gloat. I'm not going to gloat about it, but since Allah revealed it to you, I will, I will tell you about it. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So he says, the four characteristics that I have. Number one, I never drank wine because I know that if I were to drink it, my intellect would fall. This one, in today's day and age, there are certain issues that the early Muslims dealt with that are still relevant today. One of them is alcohol. And this is something you could do an entire lecture on. Alcohol is something that, you know, we in Islam believe you should stay away from completely. And when it comes to alcohol, we see that Ja'far al-Tayyar in his, in the Jahiliya era, before the beginning of the Islamic da'wah, Ja'far al-Tayyar is saying, I never consumed alcohol. And the reason why, he says, because I know that if I were to drink it, my intellect would fall. I remember Sayyid Ammar, uh, he also explains this hadith, I'm not going to go over his explanation, but he says that, subhanAllah, in the West, the non-believers, their idea of having a good time is essentially to drink alcohol and get drunk to the point where you can't even remember what happened the night before. It's like, Habibi, with having a good time, having a fun time, wouldn't you want to remember what happened the next day? The second characteristic he says, he says, I have never lied because lying diminishes chivalry. And Jafar al-Tayyar, as we are going to see, is a very chivalrous person. Jafar al-Tayyar understands that when it comes to lying, when you get used to lying, no one takes you seriously as a man anymore. You start being seen as someone who... You know, obviously untrustworthy, but you start being seen as a scoundrel, someone who's weak, who who isn't brave enough to tell the truth. Number three, he says, I have never committed adultery before because I feared that it would be done to me. There's an Arab proverb. It goes something like this. It means that tell the qatil, the murderer, that he will be killed. Because when you murder someone, there's going to be someone else who's going to come after you. Well, zani bizzina means those who do zina with other people's maharam, eventually it will happen to them. If you commit zina, then eventually it will probably happen to the women of your household. Finally, he says, I never worshipped an idol because I know that it does not harm, nor does it benefit. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, it is Allah's responsibility to give you two wings so that you may fly with the angels in paradise. And as we shall see, this prophecy did indeed come true. When it comes to the early life of Jafar al-Tayyar, there is a detail that stands out. There's a very important detail that stands out. Four years before the beginning of the prophetic da'wah, there was a drought in Mecca. There was a drought, famine. People of Mecca went through some tough times. And so Abu Talib, salam alayhi, he personally suffered as a result. He was harmed by this, this drought. And so Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, spoke to his uncles and they agreed that they were going to help Abu Talib by taking, each of them would take one of his sons off his hands. Abu Talib kept Atil for himself because Atil was, was his favorite. 
Al Abbas took Talib, the eldest brother, the one who Abu Talib is named for. Hamza Salamullah Ali took Jafar al Tayyar. And this is something very interesting because we can see many similarities between Ja'far and Hamza and their merits, their bravery, their dedication to Islam. And this is because Ham like Hamza took his nephew in and raised him as like his own son for a few years. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in what is undoubtedly one of the most beautiful and most wholesome moments in early Islamic history, he chose Ali. He took Ali for himself and Ali was the youngest one. He was the 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 baby out of the brothers. And so Rasulullah said a very beautiful line when he took Amir al-Mu'mineen salam Abu al-Faraj al-Isfahani records in Maqatil al-Talibin, he says when Rasulullah took Ali, he said, I choose the one who Allah has chosen for me. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa la yantaqu an al-hawa. He says, Allah chose this one for me to raise. To raise as my, as my brother, to bring him up, to teach him, to keep him close to me. And so, Ja'far was raised with his uncle Hamza. Many years later, four years later, when the da'wah began, when the message began, say about seven years later, remember the first three years, there was the, the Prophet kept it very secret. Many years later, the story of how Ja'far converted to Islam is recorded by Al-Baladhuri. Baladhuri records that the person who brought, who brought Islam to Ja'far al-Tayyar was none other than his younger brother Ali. So he records in his bio of Ja'far al-Tayyar, he says that Amir al-Mu'mineen salam alayhi, he met with his brother Ja'far and they had a conversation. So during this conversation, Amir al-Mu'mineen salam alayhi, said to his older brother, he says uh, Ja'far heard his brother criticizing idol worship and speaking negatively of it. So he became intrigued by this. He became intrigued by this. So when Rasulullah called him to Islam, he immediately accepted. He immediately accepted that la ilaha illallah and that Muhammad was Rasulullah. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa And this makes sense because we saw in the hadith of the Amali of, of Shaykh al Saduq that even before Jahiliyyah, Ja'far never really worshipped idols. So for him, it was very, very easy when he heard his, his brother Ali hinting that there was a new message, that this way of life was coming to an end. It was very easy for him to accept this. Ja'far Salamullah this is one of his merits, is that he is one of one of the forerunners of the Muhajirin. He's one of the first people to accept Islam. And so Ibn Sa'd corroborates what his student Al-Baladri says. He says, he doesn't list exactly the order in which he accepted Islam, but he affirms that Ja'far accepted Islam before Rasulullah began preaching in Dar Arqan. This is recorded in, in Tabaqat al-Kubra by Ibn Sa'd. Ali ibn al-Athir, another famous historian, as well as our uh, Shaykh al saduq rahimahullah, record that once Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi was praying with Amir al-Mu'mineen and Abu Talib saw him. And so Abu Talib told Ja'far, he said, go stand to the left of the Prophet. Go flank your, your cousin. And so it was Rasulullah, it was Ali sallallahu alayhi wa it was his brother Ja'far. And I believe there are some reports that indicate that Khadija was among them, that they, they were among the earliest people to pray. And so Shaykh al saduq he records this tradition in his Amali and he also records that Imam al Sadiq said this was the very first Salatul Jama'ah. And Abu Talib, after you know making sure that his son went and, and prayed alongside his brother and his cousin, he recited the following poem. He said, Surely Ali and Ja'far are my true trustees when time and calamity are overwhelming. By Allah, I will not fail the Prophet, nor will my son whatsoever. Do not fail him and support your cousin. He is like a maternal brother and a father to me. And so this is a great merit of Sayyidina Ja'far al-Tayyar is that he was one of the, the one of the people in that first Salatul Jama'ah in Islamic history. And so this is in the very beginning of the da'wah, before the wars, before the battles, before the empire. Ja'far salam alayhi is part of the, the, the very, very first of the forerunners, one of the very first people to accept Islam. One of Ja'far al-Tayyar's most well-known merits and one of his most famous merits. And this is the one you see in the movies and the TV shows. And this is the one that gets brought up. And this is one of our, one of the most beautiful, the most epic, the most amazing moments in early Islamic history is the story of how Islam came to Africa for the first time, came to the blessed continent of Africa. Before we, we, we go in there, we want to give credit where credit is due. Sayyidina Ja'far al-Tayyar was married to a Sayyida Asma bint Umais, whose biography we already covered. And I believe you can... Click here, we'll put the link up top for you guys to check out. 
But we already covered her biography, we already covered her merits, what a, a supportive spouse she was to him, and how indeed we say he was blessed to have her as his, his partner. So Jafar al in the years of the early da'wah, many of the early Muslims were getting persecuted. Many of them were getting harassed. Many of them were getting tortured to death, in fact. And so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam realized that his followers, the Muslims, could not safely stay in Mecca. And they needed to go someplace where they would be safe. And that place at that moment was Africa. At the time, remember, there were empires in Iraq and Persia and you know, Syria and Egypt. But Rasulullah told his followers that if you want a place where you will be safe, I command you to go to Africa. For there, there is a righteous and a just king. And this man in, in Arabic sources is known as an Najashi. And I wish we had the time to go into the biography of an Najashi. Because an Najashi was indeed a great man. He's a man who, who we, you know, you need to do his biography on his own. Because we have, I've seen many fantastic reports about how he came to power and the way he ruled over his subjects and the way he treated the Muslims. And so today's event is about Jafar, though. So inshallah, we'll cover Najashi in more, in more depth at a later time. But in any case, Rasulullah told his followers that they needed to go to Africa. And so he tasked Jafar al-Tayyar with leading the Muslim, the, this community, with leading this, this group of exiles, this group of immigrants, this group of refugees, essentially, to um, take them to Africa and to essentially be their leader. And this is a great merit for him in that Rasulullah chose him. Jafar and many of the other Muslims, they boarded ships and they sailed to, to Africa. And they arrived in, in the kingdom of Abyssinia, the modern day uh, country of Ethiopia. In any case, when they arrived there, the king welcomed them in. And they lived very peacefully. They did not try to go around proselytizing Islam. They did not, you know, offend the native people. And indeed, this is a very interesting message because, or a very interesting parallel between us and between those early Muslims. Because many of us, as I'm sure many of us here, live in, in non-Muslim lands. And so many of us think of this situation, they're like, man, it's a really unusual situation. We're really struggling here to find rulings, to find halal meat. We're struggling with marriage. You have to remember that we've done this before. The early Muslims went through the exact same thing. Abdullah ibn Ja'far al-Tayyar was born in a kafir country. He was born in, in Abyssinia. Ja'far al-Tayyar, salam Allah alayhi, and this, or this early group of Muslims demonstrate to us that this is not a situation which we shouldn't know how to handle. We've been in a situation like this before where oppressors have driven us from our homeland where we have been forced to take refuge in the lands of the non-believers, and we have, you know, we adapt. We continue to worship Allah Azza wa We continue to observe the Sharia. And so, in the court of Najashi, as I said, one of the most epic, intense, amazing moments, one of the most beautiful episodes from the early seerah of the Prophet occurs. And so, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi had ordered them to go there, but someone was hot on their trail. When Quraysh heard the news, because you know, Quraysh were haters, they were a bunch of insecure, horrible people. When they heard the news about what happened, that all of these Muslims had gone to Africa, they did not like this at all. They said, look, if these guys go to Africa and somehow Islam grows more powerful because of them, it's going to cause us problems in the future. It's going to, to wreck our relationship with the Najashi, with the king. So we need to figure this out. So they chose two men to go to Africa and to convince Najashi to expatriate these people, to send them back to Mecca. And who are these two men? These two men were none other than Amar ibn al-Walid ibn al-Mughira and Amr ibn al-As. Now, I'm not going to go into the biography of Amr ibn al-As, but... It needs to be noted, something very, very interesting. If you ask the Muhalifin, who is the man who brought Islam to Africa, they will tell you it was Amr ibn al-As. When ironically, this is the man who tried to kill Islam in Africa. He tried to strangle Islam in its cradle in the continent of Africa. Subhanallah. Jafar al-Tayyar is barely mentioned, but the, the, this man who is an enemy of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, Ammar ibn Yasir at the battle of Safin said to Imam Ali's troops, he says, look at this man. This man fought Rasulullah twice. And here he is fighting Amir al-Mu'mineen now. Correct? 
This is the same Amr ibn al-As, by the way, who is, is well known for his uh, antics at the Battle of Safin, where when confronted by Amir al-Mu'mineen, he stripped and ran for his life. But in any case, this is the same man that, that the Mukhalifin give credit to for bringing Islam to Africa. And we, of course, know that this is not true, and we are going to present to you the facts, and you will decide for yourself. Him and the early Muslims are living in Africa when Amr ibn al-As and Umar ibn al-Walid show up in the court of Najashi. And the historical reports tell us that Najashi, rahimahullah, had a good relationship with Amr ibn al-As. Amr ibn al-As was from the aristocracy. His father was a, a well-known man. And so, you know, his friend comes in and he's like, my king, my old friend, we need you to hand over these people because they have caused trouble for us and, and they're not good for you. You don't want them here. You need to get rid of them. So... Najashi, being a, a just king, a king who is concerned about his people, he calls in the Muslims and he calls in the, and he tells them, you, you, I want you to defend yourself against these accusations. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa his companions um, arrive in the court of Najashi. When the messenger came to them, telling them that they needed to come in, they spoke amongst themselves like, what do we do? And so they said, we shall say what we know and what our prophet commanded us, come what may. We will not compromise our beliefs. We will make our case. We will defend ourselves and our beliefs. When they came into the royal presence, they found that the king had summoned his bishops with their sacred books exposed around them. He asked them, and I'm quoting the Sirah of Ibn Ishaq here. He asked them what was, their, was, was the religion for which they had forsaken their people without entering into his religion or any other. Ja'far ibn Abi Talib stepped forward and he answered, O king, we were an uncivilized people, worshipping idols, eating corpses, committing abominations, breaking natural ties, treating guests badly, and our strong devoured our weak. Thus we were until God sent us a, an apostle whose lineage truth, trustworthiness, and clemency we know. He summoned us to acknowledge God's unity and to worship him and to renounce the stones and images which we and our fathers formerly worshipped. He commanded us to speak the truth, to be faithful to our engage engagements, mindful of the ties of kinship and kindly hospitality, and to refrain from crime and bloodshed. He forbade us to commit abominations and to speak lies and to devour the property of orphans to vilify chaste women. He commanded us to worship God alone and not to associate anything with him. And he gave us orders about prayer, almsgiving, and fasting. We confessed his truth and believed in him, and we followed him in what he had brought from God. And we worshiped God alone without associating aught with him. He treated as, for, we, uh, he treated as forbidden what, we, uh, what he forbade. Sorry, we treated as forbidden what he forbade and lawful what he declared law lawful. Thereupon our people attacked us, treated us harshly, and seduced us from our faith to try to make us go back to the worship of idols instead of the worship of God, and to regard as lawful the evil deeds we once committed. So when they got the better of us, treated us unjustly, and circumscribed our lives, and came between us and our religion, we came to your country having chosen, having chosen you above all others. Here we have been happy in your protection. And we hope that we shall not be treated unjustly while we are with you, O King. Before we continue, Allah, these words are, are very, very powerful. And every single one of us should say, Alhamdulillah ala ni'mat al-Islam. Alhamdulillah, who blessed us with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who raised us out of ignorance and brought us out from the darkness of jahiliyyah into the nur of Islam. Allahumma sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad wa Muhammad. So here, Jafar al-Tayyab shows, once and for all, this is another very important lesson. When you live in an immigrant community, when you live as Muslims abroad, stick to those who know. Not everyone needs to speak. In this situation, who did the Muslims rally around? Who did they depend on to speak? The scholar. And that was Jafar al-Tayyab. And so Najashi asked him, he said, asked them if they had anything with them which had come from God. When Jafar said that, he, sa uh, he said that he had. So we do have something from Allah Azza Najashi commanded it to uh, commanded him to read it to him. So he read him a passage from Surat Maryam. And Najashi wept until his beard was wet, and the bishops wept until their scrolls were wet when they heard what was re what he read to them. Then the Najashi said, "Of a truth, this and what Isa brought have come from the same niche. You two may go, 
for by God I will never give them up, and they shall never be betrayed. So this is another interesting, you know, detail that we need to examine here. The surah that Jafar chose was Surat Maryam. And first of all, this shows us that Surat Maryam was an early surah. And Surat Maryam is one of my favorite surahs in the Quran because it is probably the best surah you can give to a non-Muslim, especially a Christian who is interested in Islam. Because it tells you the story of Sayyidina Maryam sallallahu and the story of Sayyidina Isa alayhi wa ala nabiyina afla salatu wa salam. And it does it in the most beautiful and eloquent of language. And it's very, very powerful. As in mu'mineen today, Muslims today, when they read Surah Maryam, they truly understand what is being said here. What happened here with this situation in the story of Sayyidina Maryam and her son Isa alayhi salam very, very difficult not to tear up. It's very difficult not to get emotional. And so we imagine that Najashi, a man who very, very much loved Isa Salaam, who very, very much was attached to the story. We can only, we can easily understand why it affected him, why it was so powerful for him. Continuing, and again, this is narrated in the in the Sirah of Ibn Ishaq. He covers this in detail. And there are a few other corroborating sources for it that I will go over in a second. Fearing the consequences of returning to Quraysh empty-handed, Amr ibn al-As, tried again. They said, you know what, I can't go back to Quraysh empty-handed. I've got to try one last time. I've got to shoot another shot. I've got to convince this king what, you know, what the, uh, to hand these guys over to me. So he went to him the next morning and he told him that they said a dreadful thing about Isa, son of Mary, and that he should send for them and ask them about it. And he did so. Now, before we continue, I want to note something really interesting. You will always find people who, what they do when they see, you know, for example, Muslims, non-Muslims living peacefully, right, Toler tolerating each other, respecting each other's beliefs. You're always going to see people who are always looking for trouble. And this all also happens between us and the Muhalifin. There are people who do not want you to focus on the similarities. They want to focus on the differences, not because they want to find out which one is true, because certainly Amr ibn As was not trying to convert Najashi to idol worship, but because they seek fitna, because they seek to cause corruption on the earth. So the people gathered together, asking one another what they should say about Jesus when they were asked. They decided that they would say what God had said and what the Prophet had brought, come what may. So when they went into the royal question, in the, into the royal presence, and the question was put to them, Ja'far alayhi salam answered, we say about him that which our prophet brought, saying, He is the slave of God, his apostle, his spirit, and his word, which he cast into Maryam, the Blessed Virgin. Then Ajashi took a stick from the ground and said, By Allah, Isa, the son of Maryam, does not exceed what you have said by the length of this stick. His generals around him snorted when he said that, and he said, Though you snort by God, uh, by God go, for you are safe in my country. Then he repeated the words three times. He who curses you will be fined. Not for a mountain of gold would I allow a man for you to, uh, a man of you to be hurt. Give them back their presents, because Amr ibn As and his, his friend Imara had brought presents to try to sway him, for I have no use for them. God took no bribe from me when he gave me back my kingdom, that I should take a bribe for it. And God did not do what men wanted against me. So why should I do what they want against him? Amr ibn As had failed his task and returned to Arabia while the Muslims continued to live in Africa. I want to note something here. And Najashi, rahmatullahi the reason why he says this, like, you know, God gave me my kingdom back and I never took a bribe to get it back. I never gave a bribe to get it back. This is an allusion to his story, to his backstory. And inshallah, we will cover it at a later time. In any case, Amr ibn As returned to Arabia having failed utterly to accomplish his task while Jafar al-Tayyar and the Muslims had not only managed to, you know, continue living in Africa, but in a way you could argue that they had managed to convert, Jafar al-Tayyar had managed to convert a king to Islam. And this is one of the interesting merits of al-Najashi, is that through his friendship with Jafar al-Tayyar, he is the first king in Islamic history. Think about that for a second. It was not an Arab, it was not a Persian, it was not a Greek. The first king in Islamic history was a man from Africa. Now, there are other reports that highlight 
the close relationship that Ja'far had with al-Najashi. And this is something really interesting to see because our ahadith say you need to be careful when being friends with a king. So this is a testimony to how great of a king Najashi was, as well as how Ja'far carried himself. Like it takes a, a, you know, you need to know how to carry yourself to be around such a powerful person, to know how to deal with them, to have a good relationship with them. And so Ja'far, salamullah alayhi, had a very good relationship with Al-Najashi. This king and all his power, all his might, had a great amount of respect for him. And so Shaykh al-Mufid narrates with his chain to Muhammad al-Baqir, salamullah alayhi, he says, Al-Najashi, the king of Abyssinia, sent for Ja'far ibn Abi Talib and his companions. When they called upon him, they saw him sitting on the dusty ground, wearing old clothes. Ja'far ibn Abi Talib said that when we came, we saw him in that condition. We were taken by fear, but upon sensing our concern and the change of color in our faces, he says, he said, praise be to Allah who helped Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and thus cooled and comforted my eyes. May I not give you good tidings? I said, yes, O king. He said, just now one of my informers in your land has come to inform me that Allah helped his prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and destroyed his enemy. And so-and-so has been taken prisoner and so-and-so has been killed. They had confronted each other at a place called Badr. As if I see him the way I used to tend my master's cattle there who was from Banu Zamra. So Ja'far said to him, O benign king, why do I see you sitting in the dust wearing old attire? He said, O Ja'far, we read in what has been revealed to Isa alayhi salam that it is Allah's right over us, his servants, that whenever he bestows a bounty upon them, they should show humility. So when Allah blessed Muhammad, his prophet, with the bounty, I preferred this humility before him. He said, when Rasulullah learned about this, he said to his companions, giving away in charity and alms increases the wealth of its owner. So give alms, may Allah have mercy on you. And humility elevates and enhances the stature of the one who adopts it. So be humble, may Allah elevate you. And be forgiving. For forgive, uh, and be forgiving. Forgiving increases the honor of the forgiver. So be forgiving that Allah may bless you with honor. This is one of the beautiful hadiths of the Amali of Shaykh al Correct? This is a, an example of how Shaykh, uh, not Shaykh al-Nasr al-Mustafullah, Shaykh al-Mufid. Shows why, for some people like me, Amali Mufid is the, is the best one. Years later, when a Najashi uh, passed away, and again, I, I hope to cover his biography in more depth, inshallah, it is narrated by Sayyidina Abu Tufayl. Uh, he narrates this hadith from one of the Ansar. He narrates that when the news of a Najashi's death reached Rasulullah, he said, Your brother Najashi has died, so stand and pray for him. And so we form two rows behind him. It's narrated by Al Mujamma' ibn Najari al Ansari. And so this is one of Ja'far's great merits, is not only did he manage to maintain a friendship with this king, but it was through this king, through him, that this man embraced Islam. And like Ja'far al-Tayyar, he is also someone whose, whose history, his biography is very neglected. When Ja'far al-Tayyar was in Africa, there's another narration I wish to share with you. When he was in Africa, and this is narrated by tafsir, uh, in Tafsir al-Qumni, it is narrated that when Ja'far was in Africa, the Battle of Badr happened. Ja'far was not at Badr or Uhud, he was in Africa. He was waging a different kind of jihad, we would say. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam won the battle of Badr, we see the news, how it reached Ja'far through the king. The king's messengers brought him the news. But on the other side of the Red Sea, during the battle, Ubaidah ibn al-Harith was, was wounded. And he would die of, of his wounds during the duels before the battle. So when he was brought before Rasulullah, he said to him, if your uncle were alive, he would have known that I am more deserving of what he said. Rasulullah replied, which of my uncles do you mean? He replied, Abu Talib, where he says, we keep him safe until we are struck down around him and forget our sons and wives. So Ubaidah is saying to Rasulullah, is like, Ya Rasulullah, today I have proven that I am worthy of, of what Abu Talib has said, that we will lay down our lives to protect you. We'll lay, give up our, the lives of our sons as well. So Rasulullah said to him, he says, do you not see that his son like a lion between the hands of Allah and his messenger, meaning Ali? And his other son is engaged in jihad fi sabilillah in the land of Abyssinia. And this is a reference to Ja'far. One brother was fighting at Badr. The other one was in Africa. This shows you that being a Muslim living in a non-believer's land is, is jihad in and of itself. It is a test from Allah Azza wa Jal. 
There is a an interesting point I wish to go over regarding in Najashi really really quickly. I think we have the time. Najashi, when it comes to his his Islam, why didn't he convert his kingdom to Islam? Ibn Taymiyyah was actually once asked this question, and he gives an answer that is both detrimental to him and his sect. He said Najashi in this situation was not capable of of you know spreading Islam. If he had tried to convert his kingdom to Islam, his kingdom would have been he would have lost his power, and then the Muslims would have been put in danger. So this is really interesting because subhanAllah, when it comes to the innovations of the rulers before Imam Ali, the Mukhalifin are always quick to, to point out, it's like, why didn't Ali change them? And we always reply because he simply could not do so without incurring serious consequences. Saad, he narrates that when Ja'far al-Tayyar returned from Africa, and he narrates this from Imam al-Rudha alayhi salam through his golden chain, through his forefathers, he says when he returned from Africa, Rasulullah took 12 steps towards him to welcome him. He hugged him, he kissed him in between his eyes. He cried and said, O oh, Jafar, I cannot tell whether I am more pleased by your return or the victory at Khaybar granted by God to your brother Ali. And the Prophet them cried out of the joy of seeing him. And this is amazing. This is amazing because all you guys know what happened at Khaybar. You may not know all the details and we'll cover it inshallah. But Khaybar was, uh, was one amazing victory, wasn't it? And here is Rasulullah telling Ja'far al-Tayyar. He says to him, Ja'far, I don't know which one makes me happier. The victory at Khaybar or you returning from Africa. And this just goes to show you how much Rasulullah loved his cousin Ja'far al-Tayyar. And so Rasulullah gave him a gift. He gave him a gift. And this is something very, very special. A few days ago, there was a, one of the, the mu'mineen asked me, Said, man, Muhalifin have all these like Sunan and these Mustahab prayers, and they have Taraweeh, and they have this, and they have that. I remember there's Salatul Duha, which is another bid'ah. What about us? Do we have any like special Sunan Salat, like that sort of Salat, these Mustahab Salat? And SubhanAllah, ask and you shall receive. It is narrated by Shaykhun al Kulaini and Wallahu Qabra in Kitab al Kafi. He narrates that Rasulullah said to Ja'far al-Tayyar, he said, O oh, Ja'far, should I grant you and give you an, an, an award to you, a gift? Ja'far said, yes, Ya Rasulullah, please do. The narrator said that the people thought Rasulullah might give him gold or silver. So the people remained anticipating, like, oh, Ja'far has come back and Rasulullah is about to give him all this money. He's going to give him gold and silver. He's going to give him something valuable. SubhanAllah, this is, this, some things never change. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I will give you something. And if you practice it every day, it will be better for you than the whole world and all it contains. If you practice it every two days, Allah forgives you during the time in between. For you're practicing it every Friday or every month or every year. Allah grants you forgiveness during the time in between. Perform, and then Rasulullah gives him the instructions. Perform four rik'ahs of salat. Begin the salat, complete the recitations, and they say Allah is free of all defects. All praise belongs to Allah. No one other than Allah deserves worship, and Allah is great 15 times. In the ruku'ah, then say, ten, say it 10 times. After ruku'ah, when standing, say it 10 times. In the first sajda, say it 10 times. While sitting between the two sajda, say it 10 times. In the second sajda, say it 10 times. After the second sajda, before standing up for the second rak'ah, say it 10 times. This amounts to 75 tas tasbiha, which makes it 300 tasbiha in one rak'ah, and in four rak'ah salat, it becomes 1,200 tasbiha, tahlila, tahmida, and takbira. You may perform this salat during the day or night as you wish. Shaykh al Kulaini further adds, he adds that it is a hadith narrated, and he gives you another chain, and he has an entire chapter on this hadith. Imam, one of the Imams, I believe this is Imam al kalam salam Allah Imam al kalam said to one of his companions regarding that, regarding this, well, he was asked, what is the reward for praying the Salat? The Imam said, if his sins are as many as the grains of sand in a pile, Allah forgives them. He then looked at me and said, this is for you and your people alone. Mukhalifin do not have this Salat. This is something our Imams transmitted. The gift of Rasulullah to Ja'far al tayyar and Shaykh al Kulaini transmitted an entire chapter regarding the, the benefits of this prayer. I want to note something. First of all, this what is this called? The Salat. What is it popularly known as? The Salat is known as Salat Jafr al Tayyar. And it is one of the longest and most high level, we would say, of the Sunan Salat and the Nawafil. Sunan Nawafil, Mustahab prayer. 
And like I said, Sheikh al Kulaini narrates an entire Bab in Kitab al Kafi just about the merits of this Salat alone. And I remember the vast majority of those hadith were like authentic, like Hassan and Sahih. When it comes to this prayer, there's a few things we need to know, a few interesting facts. Number one, as noted, the Mukhalifin do not have this prayer. This is, the, the, this is a gift from Rasulullah to Ja'far al Tayyar and to the, the lovers of Ja'far al Tayyar. Number two, there's a, a funny proverb that we have in the Arab world. If someone is taking long in Salat, do you know what you say about them? You say, what is he doing? Is he praying Salat Ja'far al-Tayyar? Is she praying Salat Ja'far al-Tayyar? Because it's a very long Salat. It's a long one. It's only for those who have that, that love of, of Salat. Those who Allah has blessed with that great love of Salat. Where they would do it like Rasulullah said. There are those who can pray it every day. There are those who can pray it every week. There are those who pray it a month. There are those who can pray it in a year. And the benefits for it are amazing. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi granted this blessed gift to Ja'far and immortalized him not only in history, but in our a'mal. So whenever we pray the salat, we remember Ja'far al-Tayyar sallallahu alayhi wa remember his jihad fi sabilillah and how much sabr he had living in a foreign land and persevering and being patient. Moving on with his biography, shortly after the Battle of Khaybar, a, another famous event happened in the seerah. And this is the event of Hudaybiyah, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. We're not going to go over it in detail. But during the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, while the Muslims were negotiating with the Kuffar, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, is, while he was negotiating with them, the daughter of Hamza sallallahu alayhi was still in Mecca. And remember, Hamza had died at the Battle of Uhud. And her family had gone on without her. She did not get to perform the hijrah. So when she heard that Rasulullah was nearby, that he was at Hudaybiyah, she came out saying, Uncle, please take me with you. Don't leave me here. And so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam decided, I will, uh, he said, of course, I will take you with me. The daughter of Hamza, sallallahu alayhi And so three of the Muslims stepped up, all of them volunteering to take care of her. Who were they? One of them was Ja'far al-Tayyar. Another one was Ali ibn Abi Talib, sallallahu alayhi And the other one was Zayd ibn Haritha. Allah ta'ala alayhim wa sallallahu alayhi wa Ali said, he said, I should be the one to take care of her because she is my cousin. She's the daughter of my uncle Hamza. I will take care of her. So Ja'far al-Tayyar said to his brother, he said, well, listen, Ali, I have one ahead at one above you. She's my cousin as well, but my wife is her auntie because the wife of Ja'far al-Tayyar, Asma bint Umais, was the half-sister of Sayyidina Hamza's wife, alayhi salam. He said, my, well, Ali, she's also my cousin. I have what you have, but my wife is her auntie. She would be more comfortable living with me because my wife is, is her aunt. She would be more comfortable with her. And so Zayd ibn Haritha said, he said, ah, but I believe I should be the one to take her because Hamza sallallahu was my brother. Because remember Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, when he paired off the Muslims, when he uh, established bonds of kinship between them, this is narrated in the seerah of Ibn Hisham, he paired Hamza with Zayd ibn Haritha. So Zayd ibn Haritha said, he's like, she's my, he's my brother. I should be the one to, to take care of his daughter. I owe it to Hamza, salam alayhi. So Rasulullah steps in. And this narration is recorded in Sahih al-Bukhari, is narrated in At-Tirmidhi, and it is narrated in Maqatil al-Talibiyin. Uh, the story, the way Rasulullah judged is very interesting. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, he said she should go to Ja'far because indeed the aunt is like a mother. This, this girl lost her mom, but her aunt, Asma bint Umais, will be like a mother to her. Correct? But then he said to all of them, he said to Ali, he said to Ali, Anta minni wa ana mink, as, as though to, to assure them that it's like, it's not because I have an issue with you. It's just, I think it's for the girl, she would be more comfortable with Ja'far. But he says to Ali, he says, Anta minni wa ana mink. You are from me and I am from you. And this is a beautiful merit of Amir al-Mu'mineen, salam Allah Ali. And then he turns to Ja'far and he says to Ja'far al-Tayyar, he says to him, and you are the most similar to me in terms of my appearance and my character. This is a merit of Ja'far al-Tayyar. If you want to know how Ja'far al-Tayyar looked like, he's very similar to Rasulullah in terms of his physical appearance and in terms of his character. And he said to Zayd, Zayd ibn Haritha, he said, you are our brother in faith. Because remember, he's like, Hamza is my brother in faith. He's like, you are our brother in faith. And you are our mola, our client, our freed slave. And so this is a beautiful hadith because it gives you three in one. It gives you a merit for Ali. It gives you a merit for Ja'far. And it gives you a merit for Zayd ibn Haritha. Correct? So 
in terms of his character, Jafar al-Tayyar was well known for his generosity. Very, very well known for his generosity. Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, it is narrated from Abu Huraira, and this hadith is, is famously in Bukhari. He narrates that we used to go to Ja'far al-Tayyar's house, and he would, he used to, you know, he was the most generous of all people to the poor. He used to take us to his home and offer us what was available there, and, and he would even offer us an empty folded leather container of butter, which we would split and lick whatever we was in it. Kareem Jafar al-Tayyar. Most of us, we feel good about ourselves if we give like a homeless person or a poor person, we give them some money, we give them some food. Jafar al-Tayyar would straight invite them home. He'd just bring them to his home and he would feed them. And so his son Abdullah, this is something he seems to have inherited from his father, who's also renowned for his generosity. So now we arrive in the year 8 after Hijrah. And this is the year in which Sayyidina Ja'far al-Tayyar earned his, his most famous title. His generosity to the poor, this is how he earned the title Abu al-Masakin. But now we will see how he earned that title of his al-Tayyar, the one who flies in heaven. In order to understand the martyrdom of Ja'far, we have to have a little background knowledge of history. After Rasulullah signed the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, which stipulated peace between the Muslims and between Quraysh, Rasulullah we would say he finally had وسلم, he finally had some, some breathing room. What does that mean? After years of fighting Quraysh, finally there was peace. Finally Rasulullah could spread Islam in other directions. Quraysh was no longer a threat. So what did Rasulullah do? An event which you could also do an entire lecture on is Rasulullah's letters to the kings. Rasulullah wrote letters to the local rulers, the kings. He wrote one to uh, Heraclius. He wrote one to Kisra, who infamously tore it up. He wrote one to the ruler of Bahrain, the rulers of Oman. He wrote one to Muqawqas in Egypt. But he wrote one to the king of Busra. Busra is a town in southern Syria. And this is the same town where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and his uncle Abu Talib visited many, many years ago when he was very young. This is where he met the monk, Bahira. So Rasulullah sent a letter to the king of, of Busra, and the man he chose to deliver that letter was Al-Harith ibn Umayr al-Azdi. When Al-Harith ibn Umayr al-Azdi, he went taking this letter to the king of Busra, but he was intercepted in Mu'ta. And the ruler of Mu'ta, of that region, was a man by the name of Shurahbil ibn Amr al-Ghassani, from Bani al-Ghassan. Those of you who know Islamic history, pre-Islamic history as well, you know that Ghassasina, Bani al-Ghassan, were the clients of the Byzantines. They were allies of the Romans. They were the, the backbone of their military strength in Syria and Arabia. And so he met with Shurahbil ibn Amr al-Ghassani. So Shurahbil asked him, he said, where are you heading? He said, I'm going to the Levant. I'm going to Bilad al-Sham. He said to him, are you one of the messengers of Muhammad? He said, yes, I am the messenger of the messenger of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Shurahbil ordered him to be tied up securely then advanced and beheaded him as a captive. In Arabic, قَتَلَهُ صَبْرًا وَلَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ And this is honestly, this is something very interesting because a lot of people, when they discuss the Arab conquest movement, the Muslim conquest, what do they say? They say, oh, the poor Byzantine Empire was the victim. Muslims were these horrible, evil barbarians who came out of the desert. No, Habibi, relax. Killing a messenger, even in modern politics, modern warfare, killing a messenger is a, a justifiable casus belli. It's a justifiable cause for war. Even in the ancient world, the world of ancient Greece and Persia, the messenger was considered, you do not kill the messenger. And so they, he was the only messenger of Rasulullah. This man, Al-Harith ibn Umayr al-Azdi, Rahmatullah he's the only messenger of Rasulullah to be killed. And so when the news reached Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was angered, he was upset. And this is something very interesting. This happened way before this. The conquest of Mecca had not happened yet. The Muslims were no, not at that strength that they would have later. And they would launch the, the conquest movement later. But in spite of this, Rasulullah recognized Islam has izzah. Islam must show its strength. You cannot kill a Muslim messenger and expect no retribution, no consequences. And so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ordered the Muslims to assemble and to form an army, to form a force to march north and to make the, the Romans pay for what they had done. And this is the campaign of the Battle of Mu'tah. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he put Zayd ibn Haritha 
in command. And there are some scholars who have argued that it was in fact Ja'far who was number one in command. But it seems to me the more authentic view is that it was actually Zayd. So Zayd was put in command. And if Zayd were slain, then Ja'far al-Tayyar was to take command. And if he were killed, then Abdullah ibn Rawaha would take command. The fact that this army had three commanders, that Rasulullah had assigned multiple commanders one after the other, some historians call this, they call it Jaishul Umara, the army of, of emirs, of the three emirs. The expedition got ready to the number of 3,000 men, and they set out north. They went on their way as far as Ma'an in Syria when they heard of, uh, that Heraclius had come down to Ma'ab in Belqa with 100,000 Greeks, and I'm quoting Ibn Ishaq here, and 100,000 men from Lachman and Judam. 100,000 plus 100,000, that's 200,000. This number is preposterous. Many modern historians believe that this is an exaggeration, that even 100,000, half of this number is too much. Some historians like Walter Kagi, who's a famous like Byzantine historian, he, uh, he believes the number was closer to 10,000. Allahu a'lam how many there were, but what we know for sure is their army was far bigger than the Muslim army. When the Muslims heard this, when they heard that their, their opponents had assembled an army of such size to meet them, they decided to stop and think of, the, think of their next move. So the three emirs and the Muslims, they you know, buckled down. Let's weigh our options here. So Rasulullah had told them that if you reach that area, write me a letter. If you want, when you reach that area, you don't know what to do, you can write me a letter. And the Muslims, that is what they wanted to do. But Abdullah ibn Rawaha, Allah spoke up. He was the third emir. And he said the following. He said, men, what you dislike is that which you have come out in search of, meaning martyrdom. We are not fighting the enemy with numbers or strength or multitude, but we are confronting them with this religion with which Allah has honored us. So come on, both prospects are fine, victory or martyrdom. And the men said, by Allah, Ibn Rawaha is right. Allah ibn Rawaha, Allah he said, guys, what are you talking about? You know, retreating, pulling back, writing also a law letter. What did we come here for? What are we doing? We're looking for martyrdom. We are looking for the pleasure of Allah and his messenger. We're not afraid of them because of their numbers. When did we ever like outnumber our enemies? This is really interesting. When you look back at the early Muslim battles, the, the Muslims were usually outnumbered. It wasn't until, you know, Hunayn came after the conquest of Mecca. Hunayn came later. It was only at Hunayn that the Muslims finally outnumbered their opponents. And even then, the numbers did not do them much good. So Abdullah ibn Rawaha is saying, listen, we've, we've done this many times. Badr, Uhud, Khaybar, Khandaq. Outnumbered is not a problem for us. We're not afraid of, of them because of our, uh, you know, because of their numbers. We don't fight these people with numbers. We fight them because of our faith. We fight them using this religion, which Allah has honored us with. And so the Muslims decided, let's do it. Let's take them head on. And that is what they did. The people went forward until they were on the orders of the, Bel of the Belqa. The Greek and the Arab forces of Heraclius met them in a village called Masharif. When the enemy approached, the Muslims withdrew to a village called Mu'ta. When fighting began, Zayd ibn Haritha fought holding the apostle's standard until he died from the loss of blood among the spears of the enemy. Then Ja'far took it and fought with it until when the battle hemmed him, he jumped off his own mare, his horse, and hamstrung her and fought until he was killed. Ja'far al-Tayyar was the first man in Islam to hamstring his, his horse. What does this mean? What's the, the logic behind this? This is really interesting. In pre-Islam, in Jahiliyyah, what Arab warriors used to do, they went into battle, they would make a show of hamstringing their horse. And this was supposed to symbolize that, you know, I'm built differently, I'm powerful, I'm not scared of you, I've killed my horse, I've killed my only way of retreat. Ja'far al-Tayyar is the first man in Islam to do this, and we have hadith on this in both our books as well as the books of the Mukhalifin. So it is in Al-Kafi, in volume 5. It's narrated by the Ahlul Bayt and is also narrated in the books of the Mukhalifin. It is narrated in Sunan Abi Dawood as well as in Tarif al Tabari. And so the question is why? Why did Ja'far do this? And what is the ruling that some of our ulama take from this? Some of our ulama, this is very important for fiqh. Scholars have concluded the reason why Ja'far did this is because he knew he was going to die fighting. He knew he was going to go down fighting. He knew that martyrdom was at hand. 
and he did not want the Romans to take his horse and use it against the Muslims. And so this is a famous fatwa that the ulama have given, is that in battle, this is an old fatwa back in the day, it doesn't really apply too much anymore, at least with horses. But back in the day, if Muslims feared that they would lose the battle, what they would do is they would hamstring their horses. They say, if we're going to go down fighting, we're not going to let them take our horses and use them against our fellow Muslims. And so this speaks to the bravery and the courage of Jafar, is that in this situation, when he saw that he had no hope of escaping, he decided that he would go down fighting. He would fight these people to his last breath. He decided that he was not going to give them his horse. He wasn't even going to give them the satisfaction. And so it is recorded by Ibn Ishaq with his chain. He says, a man from Banu Murrah ibn Auf who was at Mu'tah said, I seemed to see Ja'far when he got off his sorrel and hamstrung her and then fought until he was killed. And he said, welcome paradise so near, sweet and cool to drink its cheer. Greeks will soon have much to fear, infidels of descent unclear. When we, met their when we meet their necks, I shall shear. Al-Bukhari narrates from Ibn Umar, who says that on the day of Mu'tah, he stood behind Ja'far al-Tayyar when he was martyred. And he counted 50 wounds on his body caused by stabs or by strokes, and none of those wounds was on his back. Another report. So the, according to this report, how many was it? It says it was 50. Bukhari also reported, another report from Ibn Umar says it was 90. This is uh, also reported by Al-Hakim with his chain to Ibn Umar. He says, we found him among the slain and we counted 72 wounds on his body. So we have 50, 90, and 72. And yet another report says that Ja'far al-Tayyar, and this is reported by the family of Umar ibn Ali. I don't know if this is Umar ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib or Umar ibn Ali ibn al-Husayn. So this is a narration that comes from, we'd say the Al, from the Prophet's household, from other Talibiyin. He narrates that it was actually, uh, that it was in fact 30. And so Allahu A'lam how many times he was wounded, how many times he was struck on that day. But perhaps the most well-known detail about this battle is recorded in Mustadrak is narrated from Ibn Abbas. He says, while sitting, Rasulullah received the greeting of Salam. He then said to Asma bint Umais, who was near him, said, O oh, Asma, this is Ja'far ibn Abi Talib with Jibra'il, Mika'il, and Israfil. They have greeted us, so return the greeting to them. Ja'far informed me that he met the polytheists on such and such a day before he passed by the Messenger of Allah, and he received 72 wounds from strikes, stabs, and blows. Then he took the banner in his right hand and it was severed. Then he took it with his left hand and it was severed. And so Allah replaced his, his hands with wings with which he flies with Jibra'il and Mika'il in paradise, descending wherever he wishes and eating from its fruits wherever he, whatever he desires. Upon hearing this, Asma expressed her joy for what Allah had bestowed upon Ja'far in his reward. However, she was concerned that people might not believe her. So she suggested that Rasulullah ascend the mimbar and inform the people about it. The Prophet then ascended the minbar, praised and thanked Allah and said, O oh people, Ja'far along with Jibra'il and Mika'il has two wings. Allah has replaced his hands. He greeted me. The Prophet then informed the people about Ja'far's encounter with the polytheists. It was after this incident that people began to recognize and acknowledge Ja'far's extraordinary status and he was given the, the title at tayyar the one with the two wings in paradise. Corroborated by Shaykh al-Kulaini in Kitab al-Kafi. Ja'far alayhi, after he was struck down, Abdullah ibn Rawaha alayhi, 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 he took command and he too fought until he was martyred. And then the Muslims chose Khalid ibn al-Walid to lead them and he gave the order to retreat. And so they withdrew. And so Islam's first battle with the Byzantines, subhanAllah, had not ended in victory. But the Muslims had lost three commanders before finally deciding that they couldn't win. That is quite inspiring to see that the Muslims, in spite of losing three commanders one after the other, in spite of Ja'far losing one arm after the other and still refusing to go down, the Muslims had managed to, you know, make a first impression on the Greeks that they would not forget soon. And sure enough, within a couple of years, not only would the Muslims overrun the Byzantine Empire, but they would take Constantinople itself. No doubt that the Muslim soldiers who fought the, the Romans in all those decades, all those centuries that passed, 
no doubt they were inspired by this first battle between the Muslims and the Byzantines, between the example of Zayd ibn Haritha and Ja'far al-Tayyar and Abdullah ibn Rawaha. And so when it comes to Ja'far's legacy, I want to talk about his legacy for a little bit and then we'll, we'll bring this to a close. Like all great martyrs, Ja'far al-Tayyar's death on the battlefield did not mean the death of his legacy and his memory. As we mentioned, his mil you know, no doubt in military legacy, every Muslim who went into battle against the Byzantines would remember the example that he set. But Ja'far was survived by three sons. And we have narrations that say that when Ja'far, the news of Ja'far's death reached Rasulullah by way of the Wahi, he took Abdullah ibn Ja'far and he held him and he cried. And Rasulullah used to to care very much for Ja'far's children. And then later after Rasulullah was martyred, Amir al-Mu'mineen did the same. So the most famous of his sons is Abdullah ibn Ja'far, who would later marry a Sayyid Zainab bint Ali ibn Abi Talib. And as we mentioned before, he was very famous for his generosity. Abdullah would narrate, this is a very beautiful narration. He says, because remember Abdullah was very young when his, uh, when his father passed away. He, he was about 10 years old, I believe, when Rasulullah was martyred. So he was very young at the Battle of, of Mu'ta. He was about, we'd say, eight years old. Jaf uh, Abdullah ibn Ja'far narrates the following. This is recorded by Ibn Abdul Bar in Al Isti'ab. He says, Whenever I wanted something from my uncle Ali, and my uncle Ali, my Ammu, would tell me no, what would I say? I would say, Bihaqti Ja'far. And Amir al Mu'mineen would give him what he wanted. There are also many hadiths in our corpus which make it clear that Ja'far and Hamza alayhim, were of a very special status. Particularly Ja'far and Hamza are always singled out. With some hadith stating that when Nuh alayhi salam will ask Rasulullah who will bear witness that he delivered his message, he will call upon Ja'far and Hamza to testify. He says, these are my witnesses. You say this to Nabi Allah Nuh alayhi salam. He says, these are the ones who will witness that I delivered my message, that I did everything. Allah wanted me to. al kulaini also narrated that after his victory at the Battle of Jamal, Ali alayhi salam gave an address. And he said, there is also no doubt that the best among the people after the executors of the will of the prophets are the martyrs. And the best of the martyrs is Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib and Ja'far ibn Abi Talib salamullah alayhim, who, were, who was given two fresh wings with which he flies in paradise. No one else besides him from this ummah received two wings. This hadith is, is narrated in Kitab al-Kafi. So you see, years later, Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu alayhi was so proud of his brother, so proud of, of what he sacrificed, that he laid down his life for the sake of Islam. And we have other narrations that say that Rasul, when Amir al-Mu'mineen would do muhajajah with his opponents, such as in al-Khisal when he argued with Abu Bakr over who was more deserving of the Khilafah, or we have another report. This is the famous report of Abu Tufail regarding the Consolation Day, which we'll probably have to do a whole event on. When Amir al-Mu'mineen was arguing with the five others in the Council of Six following the assassination of Umar, one of the merits that he cites, he would ask them, do any of you have a brother like mine, who is Ja'far al-Tayyar, who Allah gave two wings in heaven to him? I want to mention something about these wings really quickly. What's the point of giving him wings? Because you know in Jannah everyone can fly. In Jannah, if you want to fly, you can just fly. What's the wing? What are the wings for? See, these wings are not just for him to fly around in. Some of our ulama have said these wings are a symbol of his status. Anyone can fly around, but no one has the wings like Jafar. No one has that mark of honor, that special symbol that shows his high status among the shuhada, among the great Muslims. When Muhammad al-Baqir was asked by one of his companions, he said, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, why did Bani Hashim fail to support Amir al-Mu'mineen following Saqifah? Imam al-Baqir said the following. He said, by Allah, if Hamza and Ja'far were present among them, they would not have achieved what they achieved. And this is while being a great merit of Ja'far al-Tayyar, this is a very painful one, is that Amir al-Mu'mineen had lost his uncle Hamza. He had lost... Ja'far al-Tayyar. Who was he left with? He was left with Aqil and Abbas. If only he had Ja'far and Hamza. And Amir al-Mu'mineen himself would echo this notion. In Nasr bin Muzahim's Kitab Safin, he narrates the following. He says that when Ali heard of Amr ibn al-As forming an alliance with Muawiyah to fight against him, to oppose him, he recited the following lines of poetry. 
Ibn Harb, if I had Ja'far or Hamza the esteemed the honorable, then Quraysh would have seen the night stars in the midday. He says, Ibn Hind, if only I had Ja'far and Hamza, all of Quraysh wouldn't be able to stop me. All of you could, could oppose me and I would overcome all of you. If only I had Ja'far and Hamza by my side. You see that Amir al-Mu'mineen, not only was he proud of his brother, but he missed him very, very dearly. And so the last narration that I wish to go over with regards to Ja'far al-Tayyar's legacy is one that comes from Karbala. Now, subhanAllah, when it comes to Shuhada, the axis always revol- it always goes back to Karbala. It all revolves back to Karbala. Because Ja'far al-Tayyar, many of you know, we m- mentioned the similarity between him and his nephew, how they both lost their arms. Both of them went down fighting for their imam. Both of them were paragons of chivalry and courage and bravery and manhood. And both of them, you know, that famous title that Abu al-Fadl has, the Alam Dar, the one who carries the banner. That was Ja'far al-Tayyar, his uncle, all those years before. But perhaps the most interesting and the most sad and the most powerful reference to Ja'far al-Tayyar comes on the 10th of Muharram. When Imam al Hussein came out on his horse and delivered that long address to the army of Yazid, only a fraction of which has survived and reached us, he asked them this question. He said to them, was not Ja'far, was not Ja'far who flies with two wings in heaven, my uncle? He said, Bala ya ibn Rasulullah, Bala ya Aba Abdullah, Bala ya Sayyidi Shuhada, Ja'far was your uncle. But these people gave no sanctity to the fact that Rasulullah was your grandfather. So what use was it to them? What did it mean to them that Ja'far was your uncle? What use was it to them that everything that your uncle had done for Islam, all the da'wah and all the patience and the jihad fi sabilillah, until he went down, he laid down his own life. None of these things meant anything to those who opposed Abu Abdullah al-Hussein. And indeed, one last reference, two of Ja'far al-Tayyar's son, grandsons died fighting alongside Abu Abdullah. Aun and Muhammad, who are the sons of Abdullah ibn Ja'far, and Sayyidatuna wa Mawlatuna Zainab al-Tahira, Zainab bint Ali ibn, ibn Abi Talib. With that being said, we will bring this biography to a close. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, bihaqqi Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad, do not put a barrier between us and our Salaf al-Salih. Ya Allah, allow us to emulate the great deeds and the example of Ja'far al-Tayyar, salamullah alayhi, of his brother, Amir al-Mu'mineen, alayhi salam, of his master and our master, Muhammad, Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa Ya Allah, bihaq Muhammad wa ali Muhammad, grant us the patience and the strength to wage our jihad, whether it be in our day-to-day deeds, and when it comes to avoiding haram, when it comes to helping our fellow mu'mineen, when it comes to those of us who wish to pray Salah Ja'far al-Tayyar, give us the strength to be successful in all our endeavors. Ya Allah, bihaq Muhammad wa ali Muhammad, Grant us the honor of Hajj of your sacred house. Grant us the honor of Ziyara of the blessed grave of Ja'far al-Tayyar. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep us and you in a state of peace and a state of tranquility. And we will end this majlis salawat upon Muhammad wa alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad.